I can't tell you how good it is to see each and every one of you here today. Um, let me just say this. Let me start by saying this. Happy Easter, right? Happy Easter. Now, I, I pray more than anything that you're uh, as excited as I am about this little girl and this message today. Because her face represents my week. I'll be honest. And as excited as I am about today, I'm excited about next week. I hope that you will join us as we start a brand new series uh, entitled Roles. And I'd love for you guys to come back and be a part of that. Let me start by saying this. All of us have a fascination with life. We, I, and more specifically, I think this, uh, we, we like living, don't you? you? You just love to live. And a couple of Fridays ago, I was sitting in my car. My wife had gone into a store. I had just had surgery, and I was uh, spending some time talking to God, asking God to give me strength to be able to speak on Easter Sunday. Since I have cancer, I figure I can ask God whatever I want, and he might <laughs> oblige. But uh, I flipped on the radio, and I was sitting in my car, and who knew that God was going to speak to me through two ESPN announcers <laughs> on the radio? Because the first words that came out of one of their mouths was this. As he was speaking to his colleague, he simply said this. Do you know that next week is death week? Which caught my attention. I don't believe he was a believer, but I think maybe the other one might have been. But he said, are you talking about Holy Week? Are you talking about Easter week? Are you talking about the, the week in which Jesus gave his life? And the other announcer very flippantly said, oh, no, I'm not talking about any of that kind of stuff. So I'm talking, I'm talking about what, what's taken place in U.S. American history during the dates of April the 12th through April the 20th. Do you have any idea of what's taken place during those days on the calendar? Multiple years, but during this one particular week, have you got any idea? And he began to just go through a litany of dates, of events, of people who had experienced death, during this one seven, eight day period, April 12th through April 20th. Here's a few of those dates. They're a little small, you can read them, but the Civil War started that, that week. Dr. Kevorkian was sentenced. Abraham Lincoln was shot and killed. The Titanic went down. Uh, the Bay of Pigs took place. The West Fertilizer Company in West Texas blew up and exploded. The San Francisco earthquake killing 4,000 people happened that week. The American Revolution began this week on the calendar. Shot heard around the world. Remember the Branch Davidians down in Waco, they were besieged by the ATF. That happened this week. The Oklahoma City bombing, the Columbine school shooting. Think about all that takes place in a week. And you add to that what happens even in the world, not just in America, but even this week, the world had to stop and take notice of a cross because of a fire. It's been quite a week. In history, it's been even quite a week for me. I never dreamed that my week, that week, this week in April would be for me what it has been. But I've, I've been living my life camped out in, in the passage of Scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when the Apostle Paul says these words, we're hard-pressed on every side. But we're not crushed we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Amen. And then if I could personalize this just a little bit from the words of Paul, he's, I, I always carry around in my body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in, in our body. And then he says these words, so then death is at work in us. But life, life is at work in you. 
as I sat there in the car that Friday afternoon asking God to give me strength to be able to speak to you today, questions like how, how would that happen? God, should that happen? Could, could that happen? God, how, how are you going to do this for me? Because just a few days ago on Monday, I, I started chemotherapy. And I was, all week long, I was carrying around my, I, ha, I had my own death week. To be honest, I, I was literally carrying around a bag of death from the hospital. It was hooked to me all week long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I just got to take it off. It was chemotherapy killing the cells that are killing me. I had a question for my doctor because the chemotherapy that was killing those cells inside of me, I said, listen, doc, as we said it, Across from each other, he not being a believer, I don't believe, but he simply, I said, Doc, you're killing me. You're, you're, you're literally killing what's killing me. But what's going to bring me back to life? Do you have an answer for me? Do you have an answer for what, what's going to bring me back to life? And, and he simply said these words kind of scientifically and kind of, anesthetized. He just simply said, Joe, the, the key is going to be in your blood, which I knew. It wasn't going to be my blood, but I knew that life would be in the blood. He said, your cells are going to bring you back to life. And the strangest thing ever is knowing that you have something inside of you. I'm here to remind you this morning. You have something inside of you that, that literally needs to die. Something that is killing you and you being told over and over and over again, you're going to come back to life. That's a tough, tough week. On a week of death for me, I can't tell you how great it is to know that the blood of Jesus Christ is able to resurrect my life. Because what God has done for me what God has done for so many, he wants to do for you. Because God can do anything. And my week was filled with story after story after story of doctors and nurses and technicians coming up and saying, Joe, I want to tell you this. They had no idea that I was going to, what I did for a living or what, that I would be standing here today. They just wanted to tell me their stories and I can't tell you all of them, but I do want to tell you about one in particular during this ordeal that I've been experiencing. His name was Sam. And Sam was standing on the edge of my bed. I was lying on a hospital bed, and he was getting ready. He was literally getting ready to place one of these in my arm so that I could receive therapy. And the phone rang, of all things kind of halted the proceedings. He thought, should I answer that? And I go, sure, you can answer it if you want. He did. And it stopped the proceedings. The doctor stopped it. But it allowed me to hear a story. He said, Joe, he said, can I tell you a story, my story? He said, I got a, I got a story I need to tell you about death and life. And he said, I, he began to, he proceeded to tell me the story about how one Friday he was playing basketball with some of his coworkers from the hospital. And they had played for a couple of hours and they had, some of his coworkers said, hey, will you just play one more game, one more game? And he had a date with his wife for lunch and he's like, no, I don't have time. And they, they begged him. And so he, he's played one more game. He said at the end of that, he ran out to his car and on his way out to the car, he felt like he had a ton of bricks just sitting on his chest. And he opened up his car door, sat down on the seat and grabbed the steering wheel and his, his arms and his hands and his fingers began to go numb and he realized Something was going on inside of his own body. Being a heart technician, he knew something was wrong. So he thought, do I turn and go one mile home to the left? Or do I turn right and go a mile to the hospital and get some help? One mile would go to life and turning right would go to death. 
He said, so I, I picked up my phone and I had Siri dial my wife and she met me at the hospital and I walked into the hospital and there were my coworkers kind of laughing and joking, carrying on. And he said, I, I just told him, I said, he said, I, I'm having a heart attack. And they kind of laughed and said, yeah, right. And he said, no, really I am. And he laid down on, his, on a gurney and he passed out completely. His heart had 100% blockage, no blood flow whatsoever. He laid there for th over 30 minutes. The doctors finally were able to get blood to flow back into his veins, and he came to, came to life that day, gasping for air. And here was little Sam standing, as I'm sitting there listening to this story on the edge of my bed, he's got a big smile on his face, and he's staring me right in the eyes. He's got as close to my face as he could, and he said, Joe, do you believe in miracles? And I said, Sam, you have any idea what I do for a living? <laughs> I think all of us in this room are convinced that somehow life is going to get better. That somehow we can make whatever's going on in our lives better. Because we, we like living. And we'll do anything we can within our power to, to live. Can I just say this? There are some things in our lives, there are some things in my life that I cannot fix. I, health issues and struggles, battles that I face. There are things in me that are simply between me and my Savior that only the resurrection of Jesus Christ can fix. And listen, let me just say this. It's not just me. It's not just epidemic in my family. It's an epidemic in you. Because death, sin has all of us on death row. And that's why this Easter story is so important today. That's why we've been praying for you to be here today. Because all of us are enamored with the thought of, of living. But the reality is there are so many messes that we have gotten ourselves into. And it seems like in the course of time, in the course of history, this season right now, there's no greater need for hope than for right now, for something that would come along and breathe life back into you and into me. And perhaps a year ago or maybe a month ago or perhaps even last week, some of you thought you were on pretty solid footing. You thought the circumstances that you were in right now you'd never be facing. And I think a lot of people stand there today. A lot of people are anxious. They have pressures that they didn't realize like never before. They have regrets based on decisions that they've made in the recent past. And we, we stand in life wondering, where will things go from here? Can I really count on what I've really been counting on my whole life? How will I ever fight this battle that I'm facing? Have I built my life on a foundation that's going to be solid enough to see me through? And that's why I'm, I love Easter. That's why I love today. Because this is the only hope capable of sustaining you through any pain or hardship or disease even death itself, because of three simple words. He is risen. He is risen. See, the resur resur resurrection demonstrates to all of us in this room that what God has done for so many, he wants to do for you. And every one of us is in, in this room is into something. Something is consuming us, worrying us, causing us to wonder, confusing us, shocking us at times. But I love the Easter story because of the Easter narratives that are found in this book. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The whole idea about Easter is nothing new, especially if you grew up in church or around other Christians. But for some reason, so many of us have, have just missed some of the, the complexities of the, of the story, some of the details of the story, 
some of the, even the inconsistencies of the story. But when you read people like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's account of the story of Jesus, you realize that they all came to the same conclusion, the one that I want you to come to this morning. And it's simply this, that Jesus is alive. See, we believe as a church that the Easter narrative is true because people like Matthew, who was an eyewitness of the account of Jesus, he believed it. Mark, who probably got some of his material from the apostle Peter, he believed it. Luke, who started to write out his story on the account of Jesus, he, he went through all of the history, he went through all of the days, all of the weeks of the life of Jesus, and he believed it. John, John was an eyewitness, and he believed it. James, the brother of Jesus, he, he actually believed his brother was the son of God. Think about that. That's an amazing thought. We, we believe Jesus rose from the dead as a church because of the accounts of people who took the time to write it down, who actually, they actually gave their lives because of what they saw. They saw a resurrected Jesus. But the most amazing thing about the story of Easter is that the ending comes as a complete surprise to everyone. That little bit of history that changed the entire course of history and has changed so many lives literally surprised everybody. It, it began in a little first century place called Palestine where a bunch of Jewish people were hoping for a Messiah, hoping for a rescue, hoping for someone to come alongside them, someone who would show up and literally breathe life back into them. And many of those Jews believed. But like so many in our world today, some of them were growing tired, wondering if God was really going to do that. But people were still looking for a Messiah. And then one afternoon... In a very strange way, a seemingly crazy man walks out of the desert. He's dressed kind of funny. He talks kind of funny. He smelled funny. We know him as John the Baptist. His message was pretty simple. He just simply said these words, you need to get ready. You need to get ready because God is about to do something amazing. God is going to bring his son into this world. You need to repent of your sins because when God does this thing, when God does this thing, you're going to recognize that it's so unbelievable that it's a God thing. And the religious leaders of the day, they, they ran up to John. They were wondering, are you a Messiah? And he surprised them and he said, no, I'm just the one preparing the way. I'm simply preparing the way for someone coming after me. You, you need to get ready. Listen, church. You need to get ready to look for Jesus. And onto the pages of history walks Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus begins to draw enormous crowds to himself. And he begins to deal with the pain and the, the hurt and the battles in everyone's life. And let's be honest, his teaching is sometimes complicated. It was difficult at times to figure out, but he would tell story after story after story. And some of his closest friends had a hard time following their stories of Jesus. But slowly but surely, the crowd begins to shift its allegiance towards Jesus. And they begin to follow Jesus. Even though Jesus was raising the standard and continuing to tell people, listen, you've missed the point of what God intended for mankind. And then, and then something amazing happened. Something happened that changed everything. In, in the words of my friend Sam, it was a miracle. Rumor had it that Jesus had raised somebody from the dead. And it wasn't just someone, it was a, it was a famous person in their town. It was a well-liked, wealthy person in their town. Everyone knew them in their community. Matter of fact, you would describe him as a friend of Jesus. His name was Lazarus. Lazarus had died, and they had taken his body and placed it in a tomb and 
had the funeral, but rumor had it that Jesus just shows up and he raises him from the dead. And the crowd, the crowd, the crowd goes wild because Jesus has resurrected a life that was dead. Isn't that why so many of you are here today? Isn't that why so many people this morning are looking? Because we want what is dead in us to be brought back to life. And all of us in this room have a story. Stories that maybe you that other people love to hear you tell over and over and over again. Maybe, maybe it's a good thing that happened in your life. Maybe it's just one moment that happened in your life. Perhaps it's something bad that's happened in your life. And people ask you to tell that story over and over again. But listen, whenever you tell your story, people are like, are you kidding? Like, that's almost unbelievable that you came back from where you were. I want you to listen to this video. Watch this video of a man by the name of Brian. We have baptisms coming up on Easter. We have one Wednesday. Good stuff. I want it to be a good experience. My name is Brian Lavatello. I am the Facilities and Operations Director here at Valley View Christian Church. I have been at Valley View for about a year now. Uh, it's been a really good year, considering the year prior to that was the lowest point in my life. Let me put it this way. I was never a believer in Jesus. I looked at people that were religious as weak. I was the, you know, the persecutor of people who were religious. I won't go into detail, but I'll just say that I got into a fight with a Catholic priest in the grocery store. <coughs> yeah, that's on my resume. So growing up at an early age, say about the time I was six years old, I started smoking weed daily, uh, drinking alcohol, basically partying. I hit the ground running. I just remember always feeling like it didn't really matter. My future didn't matter because I wasn't gonna survive. I mean, I had friends were getting murdered, things of that nature were going on around me. The lifestyle that I was leading, I kind of felt like the same thing. You know, I remember when I turned 21, just kind of looking around going, wow, I made it. <laughs> now what? I partied very hard for 40 years. I didn't even feel like I was a person. Um, I was homeless for quite a while. Lost a lot of really good jobs because I was a raging alcoholic. I just drank a lot. When I drank, I was a very mean person. I ruined a marriage. Uh, everything I did was just self-centered. And it was horrible. It was miserable. It all came to a head on January 16th of 2018, where I was down to one bullet. I was absolutely distraught, completely lost and hollow, just couldn't stand myself at all. I basically had a breakdown to where I just decided I was sick of living. I was sick of being myself and I tried to shoot myself 23 times. I spent three days basically trying to attempt suicide. I don't know, I was crying, I remember that. I was very desperate. I've never felt like that before in my life. So at that point, I went in and I voluntarily checked myself into a crisis center. And the first person I meet is a guy that called himself Bishop. Man, he, he changed my thought process on life, got me reading the Bible. The first scripture that I read, the first book was Matthew. And I got into Matthew and I started reading it and I started looking at all these sins. And uh, I realized that, man, I was an extreme sinner. What's interesting is it took me a while to come to the conclusion that I was going to be baptized because I didn't really think it meant anything. I've got to do something. And um, 
I don't really know what possessed me to decide August 19th. I really don't. Um, but it's a date I'll never forget. Never. I want you to repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I want him today. I want him today. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Because of that confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, mm -hmm. and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can walk up out of here that new creation that we've talked about. forget the feeling it was much more emotional than I ever expected and it's very important to me that the baptistry is nice and clean because it represents a new birth prior to August 19th of 2018 I consider myself to have been just a completely different person a dead person I went from being hollow and full of hate and anger towards myself to really starting to feel like a person again. I like getting up in the morning now. I like coming to church. I like coming to work at Valley View. I work really hard. I'm very proud of the fact that I work here. I tell people all the time that I clean crappers for Christ. To this day, I can go back and look at the steps that I took and just realize that it was all building me towards coming to Valley View. I've come a long way, and this has only been a year, so. I'm looking forward to many, many more. The story of Jesus reads like our life. And throughout the Gospels, what we do is when we see Jesus, we see him unveiling his identity to all kinds of people like you and, you and I where he's filling up those of us who are empty, where he's, he's literally befriending those of us who are enemies of God, where he literally takes those of us who are enslaved in sin and, and sets us free, where he, he brings life to those of us who are dead. And as you come to the end of the story of Jesus, all, all four gospel writers do something that's really kind of amazing to me. They, they literally put on the brakes and they slow down the story a whole lot so that you and I don't miss any of the details. And as you go and maybe listen to the end of Brian's story, or the rest of Brian's story, you can also go to the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and see the extended version of the Easter story, the Easter message. And when you do, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to see Jesus as this sacrificial lamb. You're going to see Jesus as this one who, who literally carries the burden of all of our sins to a cross. You're going to see Jesus as the, this one who stands accused, this one who stands condemned, this one who, who literally is taken down off of the cross and placed in a tomb. But it's always the ending that's so surprising. Because no one, no one is, we don't have anyone in the, in, the, in the entire story anticipating a resurrection where something dead comes back to life. We don't have anybody standing outside that tomb for a couple of days just counting down 10, 9, 8, 7. No one. No one. You know what? How scripture just simply says this. Describing some women who went to the tomb. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise. They were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they, when they looked up, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. The one who was crucified. He, he has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But, but you go. You go tell his disciples. You go tell Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. And then he says this. There you will see him. This morning, many of you should be looking for Jesus. 
because of the mess in your life, because of the deadness in your life. Why? Because you love to live. You love living. And you're looking for a way to live again. And Jesus has been in the resurrection business for over 2,000 years. And there's simply no one worth more than you can put your trust and your faith and your confidence in because Jesus is not only in the life-changing business, he's in the life-giving business. And I just know this. You can be positive. You can be sure of this one simple fact that Jesus wants to provide you with as much life so that you can live again. Because most of our days, most of our days, they begin with worry and wonder. We search and we chase and we run and we, we look. Most of our days, we're unclear as to what the next step is for our life. We find ourselves searching for answers. We're not sure where to find Jesus. But I love, I love how John the Apostle records the, the words of Mary as she finds the disciples, the friends of Jesus. She simply says this, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. Listen, friends, when you see the Lord, that which is dead in you starts to come to life. And many of you this morning have yet, like Brian or like Tamara, give your life to Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism and allow God just to recreate what is dead in you. I want to invite you to explore that with us. Think about giving your life to Jesus so that what is dead in you could live once again. And my wife and I, our response to all of what's going on in our world has been to worship. Because when you see the Lord, when you see Jesus, the, the automatic response is worship. Worship will change your story and worship will become your battle cry and we, we're choosing as a couple, as a family, to worship over worry. Because when my eyes are on him, when I can see him, he starts listening to me. When we praise God with our voices, I sense his presence. When we worship God, when we see God, we worship him. He acts on our behalf and brings dead things back to life. That's my prayer for each and every one of you today. I'm going to invite you to stand. I want to pray over you. And who knows? Who knows? This may be the week. This may be the week where you come back to life, where it's no longer a dead week but it's a week of life for you. Let me pray. God in heaven, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for giving us a chance to come back to life, to take all that is dead, to renew it, and to give us another chance. God, hear our prayers today as we worship you with our voice. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.